this is my subject, how to win over colleagues and make your life easier, which we've already heard quite a lot about, haven't we, if we're, we're honest. We've you know, heard how important it is uh, to bring our colleagues along with us, to convince them to, to get buy-in, etc. But as I started preparing this presentation, actually thinking it through a little bit more, um, I actually discovered that, that I should rename the pre uh, presentation entirely. Um, and I should rename it what I've learned from watching you guys succeed. Um, because you, you've done some incredible things um, and you've achieved so much over the time that I've come to this conference. So we established apparently I've been here since 2007. Um, so, you know, I've seen the whole sector evolve and I've seen you um, do some incredible stuff. And you've been an enormous inspiration to me as a community. Um, and I often use higher education as an example when I talk with my commercial clients. And you often think it's the other way around, don't you? That, that you know, the commercial world have got it sussed and uh, you guys are the ones that are lagging behind. But the truth is, in, in, in trying to herd cats, which is what we spend a lot of our lives doing, you guys are the experts. Um, and that la la other large organisations I work with really struggle in this kind of area. So I really believe that the tide is turning in higher education. That, that it's an exciting time that people are beginning to take um, uh, digital much more seriously. I think the, the crisis that we're beginning to see in student recruitment is making people take you a lot more seriously. So it's an interesting time. So what have I learned from you guys? Well, just to kind of give you a little bit of context to that, I'm going to do what you must never do, which is talk about yourself in your presentations, because nobody's interested in that. But I kind of need to frame what I'm about to say. So I've worked with over 30 higher education institutions over the years with the work that I've done with Headscape and, and also as an independent consultant. So I've worked with a lot of you guys and I've seen a lot of what you've done. I've also written two books um, about success in the digital field and um, making the case for digital and, and making the case for a better user experience which has obviously involved a lot of research and talking to a lot of people both in higher education and well beyond that. And so all of this has led me to think, why do some digital teams struggle while others seem to succeed? What is it that makes the two different? So what I want to share with you in this presentation is 10 things that I've seen some of your teams do that have made you successful. And I've actually condensed all of that kind of knowledge of convincing people and winning people over into a set of 52 playing cards, um, which we were playing cards last night, and um, I said my presentation was going to revolve around cards, and sure enough it is. Um, so I'm actually going to give you a link to all 52 cards at the end, all right? So you can see all of them, because I'm not going to go through every one of them, um, because, you know you'd lose the will to live. Um, but I'm going to give you kind of the top 10 all kind of grouped together. So the first thing that I see successful teams do is that they show rather than tell, right? So I think it's so important that if you want to excite management and its colleagues about the potential of creating a better user experience, of, of making th um, things um, a better, you know, using digital tools, you need to show them it. Because not everyone is good at wrapping their heads around this kind of stuff. You know, they need to be um, inspired and excited. And uh, so you need a demo or a prototype or something to, to, to compel them. Something more than just a documentation or explanation. It doesn't even need to be perfect. It just needs to be something that inspires. So how, what can you do to make that happen? Well, one option is to prototype. But when we prototype, we need to prototype without constraints, right? Because we're surrounded by constraints, aren't we? Legacy technology, we've got, you know, uh, compliance issues, we've got, you know, different departments and stakeholders and all these kinds of things. So it means oftentimes when we create a prototype, we're compromising out of the gate. Right? So we never get to show the best of what could be. So we're never going to excite people in that kind of situation. 
So instead, we should be prototyping free from constraints. We need to set aside legacies and dependencies because a prototype is an experiment, right? And you can sell it as that. Oh, this is just disposable. This is just to try out some new ideas. Um, you know, and it, it's not meant to work in the real world. But what it does when you, when you produce a prototype like that is people look at it and go, wow, we want that. And that flips the conversation on its head from you having to justify every change that you want to make to other people have to justify why we can't have that lovely shiny vision that everybody got excited about. So prototype without constraints when you show rather than tell. Another way of showing is to create low lights videos, right? So when you do your usability testing, make sure you always record them. Okay, and then what you do is you edit together the most sweary moments, right? You know those moments where people get really angry and frustrated? You edit them all together and you show them to senior management, right? Because knowing in abstract, uh, you know, because senior management will, go, will say things like, oh, well, you know, okay, it's not perfect, but it's good enough, right? Or it's not worth the investment. But when they actually see the anger and frustration, then they start to take it more seriously. So low light videos are great. So record your usability <laughs> sessions, edit down the two to three mo uh, minutes of most painful video, and then play that for colleagues and management, circulate it around the organization. Nothing is more compelling than frustrated users. Another thing you could do to show rather than tell is customer journey mapping. It's a great way of educating colleagues about users and user requirements. And you can make it do even better by involving stakeholders in the creation of those customer journey maps. But because bringing them in and getting them involved in creating them gets them thinking about user needs. Because most of the time, let's be honest, all of us go through life thinking about our own needs, don't we? Right? Our own challenges, our own frustrations. <laughs> So break people out of the cycle by getting them to create customer journey maps. And if you go, um, Google customer journey map workshop, you'll, you'll find an article I've written on the subject of how to run one. Also, ensure that those final customer journey maps don't just end up in a drawer somewhere. You want to make them look great and you want to put them up and show them um, around the office and inspire them. They need to go on the walls so that they inspire you. But when you're customer doing customer journey map, don't just map the current experience, right? Map the future. Map what could be, right? To get people excited, to get colleagues excited about how we could do things better. Map the future journey. One where the user experience is better, where the organization is more efficient, where you're turning students away. That's the journey you want to map because that's going to inspire people and get them on board. Another great way is obviously to refer to the success of others. Point out how you, improving the user experience, making use of digital tools can help companies succeed. Right? And these don't even need to be companies within your own sector. Although there's ample, if you share with one another, which you have been doing, there's ample examples of that. Now, what will happen is colleagues will sometimes suggest that circumstances are different. Oh, that, that story you've told doesn't apply to us. We're, you know, we're the, the you know, school of bi the business school, because the business school's always different, aren't they? They're always, they've always got their own special thing. In those cases, don't argue, but say, yeah, you're probably right. Maybe you are different. Let's do a trial and gather some hard data and start working with them. So that's showing rather than telling. The second is to focus um, on, on other people, on users, right? I've already mentioned this, haven't I? This idea that we need to look beyond our own problems and start looking to users. Take every opportunity to tell the story of the customer experience. Because stories have power, power to grab our attention and put ourselves in the role of the protagonist. We're naturally drawn to stories. Stories are a great way of getting colleagues to imagine what it would like, be like to be a student. 
You need to make them realize the reality of being a student today, because most of them were a student 20 years ago, or more. And it's very down, when I went to university, I got a grant, right? I was paid to go to university. I came out of university debt free. So I picked a university based on the male-female ratio, <laughs> right? That's a totally different experience to a student today. I didn't really, honestly. I'm better than that. No, I would. No, no, it's true. Okay, so how do we show them that? Well, suggest testing. Every time there is a disagreement about the best approach, say, well, let's test that. Testing's a great way of resolving disagreements. It also encourages a user-centric approach to solving problems. It suggests that, it's, you know, that it actually needs to become a mantra, right? Something that's constantly being said. Put it on posters and have it on the wall. So have this kind of testing mentality. But also make sure you're doing top task analysis, right? Because when get your stakeholders to compile lists of everything they think users want to do on the website and then talk to users as well and find that out. And instead of giving equal weight to all of those tasks, get user feedback. We saw that, we didn't we, I think it was Andrew, wasn't it, from Dundee who had the, the, that kind of drop off in, in the tasks that people want to do. So top task analysis is a great way of showing stakeholders that what they're focusing on is not what users are focusing on. And then, of course, um, there are user story cards. So when, a, when a, a stakeholder comes to you saying, we want a mobile app, right, to promote this campaign, don't just take a functional spec from them, but instead say, well, what are the user needs here? Right, what's the user story? Who are you trying to reach? Begin your projects from a different premise. And the organizations that do this, the teams that do this, in fact, I expect a lot of you do it, do you? Put your hand up if you start with user story cards. Yeah. Isn't it a great way? Doesn't it work so well as a starting point? Another thing that is massively um, uh, successful with digital teams I've seen are those that fixate on answering user questions. I see um, some, uh, too many of, of our colleagues start when they write, the, uh, write for the web, they start from the premise of what do I want to say instead of what does, you know, what questions does the user want answered, right? So by researching those questions and beginning from the premise of the questions, it encourages colleagues to focus on them. And even, you might even want to build into your CMS, right? When someone goes and adds a new page to the CMS, right? You might want to add in a, a little thing at the top that says, what question are you answering? What user question are you answering on this page? Just to get them thinking about it. How else? Oops, i jump one there. If you find, and, and this, I've seen this done once or twice, and it really shifts the, the conversation, that if you start finding that the user is getting sidelined in the creation process, involve them in it. Put them in a room with your stakeholders. Run a workshop with both stakeholders and users. Not only are you going to gain the insights of users, which is great, you're also going to make sure that your colleagues are exposed to their needs. And I'm not just talking about hyper-engaged students either, right? Those that they always trawl out, the, the president of the student union or whatever. I'm talking about a normal student, right? The apathetic student. You'll have to bribe them, obviously, to get them in the room. But it's worth doing. It will change the dynamic. Another thing I've seen done is wireframing around audiences. This is a really great exercise. So you get your stakeholders in a room, um, and what you do is you get a big sheet, of flipboard piece of paper, and you fold it in thirds and then fold it in half. So you've got six uh, collaboration. Organizations that get that you need to collaborate. To spread a culture of user experience beyond your team, you need to embed the client in the experience. You need to get them working alongside you. 
And those that I, I've seen of you that have done that have just done such a stunning job and it's made such a difference. Some of you have been running design sprints. I don't know whether you've come across these, but they're a great tool, a week-long exercise where you, you get stakeholders in, you prototype and create stuff together. We also need to be educating more as well. And I see some of you are doing such great work in this, going out there, sharing what you've learned. We often think that our job is just to build products and services for users, but there are some of you that are getting the fact that you can't fix the user experience alone. And I, and I really see the tide changing on that. And, and, and you, you're getting this. This has been amazing you know, since I've been here in 2007, how much that shifted. And how you are now out there educating others about best practice. You're out there, you know, rather than just being implementers, you're engaging and, and, and spreading best practice. And that's so good to see. And there are lots of ways you can do this. We already heard about running an internal conference and making a big splash um, to, to kind of kick off a, a redesign project. I saw this done at Hull for the first, that was where I first saw it. And it was just stunning. It was a great event to excite people, to make people feel engaged. Then there are things like newsletters. And I know a lot of you are putting out newsletters, drip feeding user best practice, highlighting success stories, sharing expert opinions, showing data. But you can't let them be boring. I'm not making any judgments. But sometimes they are, aren't they? Number five on my list is to un better understand your colleagues and your stakeholders. There are some people that are investing real time in this and seeing great uh, results, that they're bridging those departmental silos. They're interviewing their colleagues. They're using every opportunity to better understand them. And there are lots of ways you can do this. Um, once you, once you kind of know what people's problems are, right, what they're likely to say, you can start preempting them. So if you create a great user experience and you know you're going to do something that someone's going to object to or have a problem with, don't hope that they won't. Instead, preempt the issue, bring it up, um, and because once people have stated an opinion about something, they're rarely going to back down. So by preempting the issue, you give them a chance to change their minds. We can also focus on threats as well. This is a really a good way of compelling people in, um, in higher education. A lot of people want to keep the status quo. They want things to continue as they always have. So if you want colleagues to improve the user experience, you need to show them that um, they're going to need to change in order to do that. But people don't like to change because things appear to be working OK. So the only way to get them to act is um, to show them that if they don't act, there's going to be a consequence. And that goes back to what we were hearing yesterday about you need a crisis to motivate people. Now maybe you need to make a crisis, show a crisis, point that out. And there are some people that are doing this. This is a really clever trick. When I first saw this, I thought this is genius, real psychology here. Sometimes the best way to get someone who's anti what you're trying to do um, is to make them the champion for user needs. So your job on this project is just to t focus on whether we're meeting user needs. And you think, surely that's crazy if they're the ones that, that are really anti. But what it does is it, it makes them start thinking about the user needs. And it makes them feel engaged and important and part of the project. Um, and so it's often a good thing to actually make that your detractor's job. To, yeah, okay, you be the champion of the user in this and hold us to account. <laughs> that always amuses me. But probably most importantly when it comes to working with colleagues, you need to target their selfish gene. And I've seen some brilliant uh, people do this. Um, Andrew said that people don't care about digital. And I absolutely agree, they don't. They don't even care about the student experience, half of them. Right? Let's be honest. So don't try and convince management and colleague to care about the user, to care about digital. Instead, focus on the things they already care about and show them how creating a better user experience or using digital tools will help them achieve their goals, right? And benefit them personally. So if they've got a particular target to meet, talk about their target. 
not about what you need them to talk about. And there are so that's that's you know some of the best um, digital leads I've ever come across get that idea. They never talk about digital. They never talk about the user experience. They talk about the needs of whoever their stakeholders are. <coughs> Number six is the really best digital teams that I've seen rely on data, and we we've heard loads about that. Andrew said that I didn't like Excel. I don't, but I do like data. You know, Piero's just talked about the importance of data. Data is such a powerful tool for convincing colleagues and management to change. So make the most of your data. Make sure you're tracking key performance indicators. Include data alongside those stories that I was talking about earlier to create a more compelling case. Because some people are like empathy driven and some people are data driven. So you put those two things together and you, you, you basically got everyone sewn up. Right? Combining statistical numbers with uh, videos of people struggling gives us the complete picture. And it, but all of that's about um, tracking the right metrics, because people are influenced by the me metrics against which they're measured. So if you start tracking how long it takes to, say, complete a task on the site, then this is what people will seek to improve. <coughs> it's a really weird thing. What you show them is what they want to be able to improve. So by focusing colleagues on the right metrics, you start to shift your thinking. And if you want to be really devious about it, one, one thing I saw and one organization do is that with each of the schools in the university on the dashboard, they had the da a dashboard of you know, the key metrics that the digital team wanted to encourage, right? But they didn't do one dashboard for each school. No, it was a single dashboard so you could see what the other schools were doing. And it created this sense of competition. Oh, how come, how come I'm not doing as well as the you know, so-and-so department? And they'd come back to the digital team and they'd go, um, we're not doing very well on this, we need to improve it. And the digital team could turn around and say, we'll help you. We'll, we'll make sure yours is better than everybody else's. You know? and, and, and so they started to play them off against one another which I just thought was genius. Also, the best digital teams are strategic as well. Often management um, have uh, you know, written some kind of company strategy, and that document that we just shove in a drawer somewhere is a great thing to use to start encouraging, um, building our strategy around. Show them how the user, a user experience design, how digital can help achieve the goals in that strategy. Okay? But don't stop there. Also, focus on, on what it is you want to, people to do and where you want them to go, but make sure you break it down into small steps. Because the bigger that you, if you go into your manager and ask for 400,000 or whatever, you're likely to um, get pushback because you're asking them to make a big commitment. So they're more likely to say no. So instead, just ask for permission to do the next small step to prototype something, or um, to, you know, to trial something, or you know, keep it small. If your, um, if your small request works, then they're going to be more confident for you to take a larger step next time, and so on. Also, have a plan and not just problems. I see some digital teams that, that really are positive and those that are moaners. Does that make sense? And management spend their lives listening to staff moan about problems that they're facing, you don't have enough resources or whatever. Don't be that person if you want to see change. Instead, after pointing out the challenges, and it's okay to do that, make sure you offer possible solutions. Then all management need to do is say yes, which is a lot easier than having to think of the solutions themselves. And here's a good tip I saw, saw one um, organisation did. Um, one digital team, they started talking about um, innovation, right? How they were doing innovation. And now, management love to support, they love the idea, oh, we're an innovative institution, right? So if you position yourself as an innovation team, then people kind of expect you to break the rules and do things differently, because you can't innovate if you just do what everybody's already done. So um, there, it, it's a great way of challenging the status quo if you talk about being innovators. And then seek out that executive sp um, sponsor. It's, it's, uh, instead of trying to win over your entire leadership team, just look for one person. 
One person who will appreciate what you can do. Focus on winning them over. Number eight is to work differently. We might not have the authority to change the entire organisation, but I have seen teams that have uh, changed the way that they work. If we include the user in our working processes, it forces colleagues to consider their needs. So, for example, we might insist that we always do testing. So things like writing policies, we've heard a lot about the importance of that, creating a set of policies, because policies aren't personal. They're impartial, applied equally to everybody. And that means you can avoid a lot of conflict. Establish a set of design principles to set people's expectations about what you're going to do. Introduce a discovery phase, a chance to focus more on the needs of users. It provides an opportunity to discuss users' needs up front. So there's so many opportunities. And, and don't forget to celebrate your successes and tell everybody how bloody brilliant you are. You're all too humble. Right? Boast a bit. Be like me. Say, tell the world how great you are. Because you're doing some great work, but I don't think people realise it because you don't trumpet yourself enough. And the good teams really get that and understand that. Talking of me, <laughs> make sure you use outside experts um, wisely. Right? People like me are massively overpriced. You know, we're really expensive. Uh, so, when you do use this, you have to use this very carefully, in the right kind of way. And one of the most valuable things that I think an outside expert can bring is that impartiality and authority, right? We often just say the same, well, we always say the same thing you say. This whole presentation has just been your ideas, right? But where we, where we bring some value is for some reason management will listen to us, probably because we're paid a lot more, more money than you are. Right? That's the horrible truth of it. Okay? So make sure you pick your moments to use us to reinforce what you're already doing. And do you know what? You don't even need to pay us for that. You can actually quote us. Quote outside experts. Quote statistics you've said, seen elsewhere. Quote Jacob Nielsen. Quote, you know, Richard Branson, whoever. Because you end up becoming an authority by association. Right? When I started doing the podcast, um, one of the unforeseen consequences of doing my podcast is I was interviewing these really clever, clever people. And then people started to think I was clever because I was talking to clever people, which was a bit naive, but that's the way people think. <laughs> and then finally, right, the best digital teams know to adjust their own attitude. In our, um, fret, fr our desperation to create a great experience, we can often appear to be a roadblock to other people's ideas. So try and avoid being critical. Remain positive, but ask lots of questions. Questions that encourage colleagues um, to identify the flaws in their own ideas, but do so in a gentle way. While you're adjusting your attitude, stop asking for permission all the time. <laughs> Just get on with your job. Do what uh, Grace Hopper said, and you know it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, <coughs> right? And never give up. Never give up. <coughs> Don't expect to win over colleagues or managements on your first attempts. The best digital teams are the ones that grind away, week in and week out, determined to change people, to change attitudes, be persistent. But don't just moan, don't just repeat their same old gripes, but instead always look to engage and convince people. So there you go, that's my list. Um, hopefully that's what I've learnt from you guys. Um, what I've done is I've put all of that together at that website address, so you can download the complete set of cards. Um, there's also, I've put links to a load of related articles for you as well. Um, of, of stuff you know, which digs into it a little bit um, uh, in a bit more depth, and you can buy the book and the, you can get physical cards if you want to as well. But the PDF of the cards are for free. So that's pretty much it. Thank you. Yeah.